Ryan Garney, welcome back to the Slightly Fuzz podcast. Man, it's I'm really, really glad you want to have me back. I enjoyed the first time. I uh, bet the second time around is going to be going to be even better. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Um, you're the first repeat guest I've had so far. All right, and, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm happy to have you back. Not only do we get to talk more about High Desert Queen this time because we talked a lot about Ripple Fest on the last mm-hmm. one. I think High Desert Queen only had one single out. I think you had just released that first music video at that time. So we have a lot more to talk about this time. Uh, I'm happy to do it. I'm also excited because on a lot of these podcasts, you know, I listen to them afterwards and I have to edit them. And I always kick myself going, man, I you know, I should have followed up with this question or I should have like pushed them harder on this thing or whatever. And and now I get to have you back and 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 ask more about stuff we even talked about on the first one. So perfect perfect right we'll get it we'll get it all out this yeah. time we'll get it all out well, let's talk about secrets of the black moon first um like i said this wasn't out yet on the last one you just had the first single since then you released two more singles and the album is out and it seems to be doing really well i, I just joined twitter with slightly fuzzed and i see people every single day talking about how awesome this album is and how stoked they are for it and you know, people seem to love it and I love it. I knew I would love it, but I, I loved it. I Thank think you. even more than I was expecting to. It's, it's a great album. So congrats on that. Thank you very much. It's, it's, uh, it's really humbling to see the amount of people that are talking about it and liking it, which makes obviously makes it even better because yeah. uh, they, they can be talking crap about it all they want and that doesn't feel that great, but I'm hearing a lot of good stuff, which is awesome. And, just feels awesome to have it released. I know we, I think we talked a little bit last time about how it's been quite a uh, ongoing process to get it released because we had finished this probably over a year ago. Right. Uh, and then, you know, pandemic setbacks and uh, distribution setbacks and all kinds of things. And finally, we just said, you know what, this is the date we're going to do. And we got it out. And yeah, we're, we're really, really happy to have it out. Uh, and it, a lot has changed since we last talked. Uh, we released, like I said, two more singles. And then finally the album and uh, feels really, really good. Like really like a huge weight to have it out because um, we want to hear what people think about it. That, there's nothing more rewarding for an artist to have it go out and then uh, have it absorbed and find out what people think about it. There's nothing more rewarding. And e- I guess that even a bad review, which, you know, to this point, luckily we haven't had any yet. You know, I'm sure they're, they've got to be coming somewhere. It's not everyone's going to like this right now, but, uh, it's been great, and but even the bad ones are great because you you learn from that and you kind of and you kind of like to you just like to hear from all perspectives. So it's do been people really even do bad enjoyable. reviews anymore? I feel like every every group that I follow that does any sort of reviews, they're always super positive, almost to a fault. Where yeah, I listen to some of these albums and I go, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe maybe we should start uh, a new review of just. We can just call it only bad reviews, <laughs> and uh, you know, like just bash uh, different uh, records that just aren't any good. But um, I don't, because I don't, I don't hear a lot of, I don't read a lot of bad reviews. You know, I, I do like. Um, I was I was prefaced before our album got out there to listen to like because we it was out you know before the album came out for all the uh, PR. Our PR firm sent it out and Ripple sent it out to uh, different writers and things. And we were warned that, hey, just be beware. Uh, Europe and the UK do not sugarcoat things. And so I was like, okay, here we go. Because they give like a lot of like, you know, out of, t- you know, numbers out of 10 and and they score it differently. They have like a scoring system. And I was like, oh, boy, uh, so far uh, it's been it's been very complimentary, so we're very we're very pleased with that. But uh, but, but we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see what happens <laughs> as yeah. as more people as more people listen to it. I mean, I know like the big guys still do you know pretty open, honest, and and it almost seems like cooler to to give a bad review if you're on like Pitchfork or Rolling Stone. You know, they like to yeah. hate on shit. Whereas like the smaller mm-hmm. guys that are like in the Doom Stone or scene, I never see a bad review come out. Yeah, and, I mean, I guess I mean, that's, not a, that's not a good thing, really, because you, you want an honest yeah. review. But yeah. and that's that's the 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 catch twenty two there. Like, oh, cool, we're getting reviewed by all these different people, and you're like, man, but I I know that that like you said, they're not as big as some of these other names, and they're not going to make any money probably giving bad reviews. So uh, I don't know. It's just one of those weird deals where yeah. you're happy to hear it, uh, but I will say there's a huge difference from hearing a review that's like, oh, you know. 
this great Austin band of Austin, Texas. And they mention like our single and then they kind of say some of the same things that a lot of others it sounds a lot like our PR uh, <laughs> press release goes out, you know, so they're just right. like kind of cop copy and pasting from that. There's a big difference between those and the ones that like walk you through like each track. Those are the coolest ones. Like, okay, these people listen to it. And I, and I, and I do, I do appreciate that at least. Yeah. I, I didn't really want to get into like track by track with this album. I, I like talking about, I mean, there, there's for one thing, there's plenty of podcasts that do that and probably do it much better than I would. So I don't really want to do that, but I, I did take a couple notes on it. And then heads will roll when you, when you release that one, it, it was like the, the first like real glimpse of like what the album might be. Cause up to that point, I just had this one single and you could have right. went, you could have went any other way with that. You could have kept going. You could have, you know, done a complete U-turn. You could have done a whole lot of different stuff. And Heads or Roll was like kind of the first one where I was like, oh, okay. And it was so heavy. I really dug that track. I also made a note, As We Roam is one of my favorite, I think, on the whole album. Thank you. Um, the Wheel was an interesting one. You have like some female vocals, I think, on there, it sounded like. Yeah, we do. Uh, there's a, so ironically, um, a guitar, one of my best friends, uh, Bobby Kirk, he um, appears on the album. He's a talented musician. We were in a band uh, together years ago, but he just never had the time to like be in a band. He's just, you know, he, he's got he's got kids and wife and and everything, and you know, life kind of got him. And and so we were never able to do any music. But I wanted him to be a part of the album. And uh, his mom is a phenomenal singer. She's kind of like a local legend around here. She's she sung with a lot of famous people back in the seventies. She's pretty legendary out here. And I was just saying, man, it would be hard to have her uh, sing on the record. And she did. And she came in and just nailed that in a day. And it was awesome. We're like, so we were laughing about how, like, Bobby, man, I really wanted you to be on this album. It sounds like your mom's going to be on it even more than you. <laughs> but uh, he is on it a few times. But he, uh, you mentioned As We Roam. He does the killer high harmony on the, the chorus of As We Roam. Uh, and it was only a matter of time. He's, he's, he's a permanent part of the band now. He was not only only guest appeared on the first uh, album, but he is uh, a permanent fixture of us moving forward. He's, he's too talented not to be. But yeah, there's some, some there's some cool stuff in there. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned heads will heads heads will roll. Um, that was Blasco was insistent on that song opening the album, and we we kind of had an idea of what the order we thought you know, should be, or, mm -hmm. you know, the best, of, the best of, to our knowledge. And, and that was like a more of an album track is what we felt like, but he just, he was adamant about it and I'm not going to argue with him. And we've had a lot of uh, really good feedback on that song because most people had been hearing uh, the mountain versus the quake, you know, for many months. It's all they had of, of us. And then yeah. that came out and it was, it was very different. So it's just cool. And then it's cool about as we roam is I think, that's probably a very good indication of where we are going as a band. That was one of the last songs that we wrote in the studio. Um, we had, so cause, cause Rusty had our guitar player, Rusty and I had a majority of the album written before we went to the studio. We we're just looking for a rhythm section to come help us out, you know? And, and then we were so lucky to find the one we did. And uh, we started creating more as we were like, let's go in with like six songs, six, seven songs that we had. And we ended up, by the time we went in there after about six practices, we had 12 songs. But As We Roam was probably the last song that we did. Um, and that's kind of a good indication of where we're going, I think. Interesting. I, I definitely want to talk more about like where you're going next. But let's go back to Blasco a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> because we, we talked about Blasco as we talked about Carl Daniel Leiden on the last one. And I want to talk about both of them and their influence on the record. instrumental yeah because i mean obviously blasco already has a proven track record with you guys holy death trio what was the third that he signed the, that was third right? he's he signed mother Iron, mother iron horse he signed okay. uh oh man you're gonna make me then he signed sun crow and they were killer okay um and, so i know of another one that's kind of in the works that's probably not really official yet and i love uh, that as do i, I so he, and, and he's, I, he definitely knows he's what he's talking about. And he definitely mm -hmm. knows what he's talking about. He, he's already proven himself <laughs> so so quickly. Right. Uh, so what what is it about Carl Daniel Lydon specifically? Is it that he has a knack for saying yes to the right bands and no to the right bands? But uh, like, 
I think so. Or is it just his talent that brings a band that is good and makes them amazing? Because like I, you mentioned Lowrider and Refractions was like my favorite record of 2020. Same and here. Greenleaf, I think came out in 21, but also a, a, an amazing record. And then mm-hmm. now you guys, is, is he just really good at, at saying yes to the right people? Or is he good at like bringing music to another level? I think it's got to be a combination of both. I mean, he is extremely talented. When we, because we reached out to him, we weren't, you know, we're, we're like, we're nobody. He's not going to come back to us. But, you know, I was going to ask anyway. I, I've, I have no problem being told no. And um, we were just thrilled when he came back with like adamantly like, yes, I, I want to find time to, to do this record. Because he had heard the songs that we had and he's like, okay, I hear what you've got and I hear what it, needs to sound like and um i i know he gets highly sought out he's highly sought after you know he's not i'm sure he tell he does i'm i know he tells a lot of people no and so we were very thrilled to be told yes so i think he has he's got a knack of 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 finding bands you know and i and i love to say that we're you know included with that it feels weird to even do it because i've admired his work for so long um because he he ha- he does these bands that are just you know, extremely talented, but his, he has a sound. And when we're listening to that Refractions album, for example, there's something about the bottom end of that record. The low end just comes out still so clean. I remember going, that is exactly what we want to sound like. We, we want to have this, you know, we come from the 90s, you know, like this 90s record of just raw grunge and so we need to have that. Be you want to have this kind of refined low end, and and he for whatever reason he's 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 really dialed into that. I mean, that's his talent. And it was awesome because I literally gave him like a few notes after he's like, okay, so I'm, I'm in. Give me some time. He was actually working, and we found out later he was working on, which is exciting news. He was working on a, a new uh, lowrider album already. Oh, really? Uh, that's just which is really exciting. Awesome. Uh, wow. Yeah. And he was, they were in the studio. Might have like, another twenty years before we get another low rider. Exactly. That was that was the best part about hearing that, right? You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, sweet. I won't have to wait, you know, until 20, 20, 45, whatever, to get another low rider album. But because uh, he was like, yeah, yeah, I want to do this. I'm just, you know, I, I've got a project I'm working on now, so give me some time. We're like, yeah, well, uh, with this pandemic, we it was like one of those perfect storms where we we had time to wait. Like we weren't in any hurry because there was nothing happening in the scene. So it was one of those perfect storms, I guess, uh, for us. And, and he, uh, then he got back to me saying, all right, sorry. You know, like I was working with lowrider. I was like, Oh uh, yeah, by all means, please go finish that. Like, don't, don't delay for us. But he's like, no, no, we've got tracks recorded. They're going to go and they, they take some time to record, which is cool. But, um, he, I gave him notes, like a couple things was we were going for. And he just knocked it out of the park. He just did an incredible job. Uh, I, there was little to almost no, um, like corrections, you know, like maybe there may have been like two times where I said, Hey man, can you do like a little more delay on that? You know, but there was never a part where Rusty had to say like, cause when is a guitar player and not have to say, bring my guitar up or when is a bass player and not say, I want to like, you know, it's just, it, everything was in its place. He, he's mm-hmm. a super, superbly talented engineer and we're happy to work with them and and the exciting thing is we've already talked about uh working with them moving forward and so that's you know, i was gonna ask i was gonna ask if you if you had them in mind for the for the follow-up oh, to in my mind there's there's nobody else i mean the work he already did with us already and of course his his catalog and when you have someone like that willing to work with you you don't you don't go another way <laughs> you just yeah. you ride that horse until you until it dies you know so we'll We'll see how, that's how it is. In fact, we were even trying to make plans to uh, actually record in Sweden with him, with like like the Lowrider, like Greenleaf, like those bands, like Domcraft, the bands that actually went into his studio to record and had him produce and engineer. Um, Sign of the Times are making that difficult, and also because we are pretty ready already to get back into the studio and record, um, even though we what we've got an album that's like four days old. Yeah. Um, so uh we of course uh, the good news is there's some there's some you know restrictions that are being lifted in place in parts of the world where he's at um so it's interesting to think about moving forward but we've kind of already started to make preparations for recording the next album so we probably won't be recording in sweden but 
I will, if, if the opportunity arises, I'll, I'll, we will take it. Yeah. All right. So how about the, the, the next step then? I, I watched your live stream. Uh, actually, before I get into that, I should tell you, I, I had a pretty doom filled weekend. Um, I wasn't okay. sure if I would be able to check out your live stream or not. My kids control the TV like 24 <laughs> seven cartoons yeah, yeah. And, and Disney movies. And then Absolutely. at night, you know, Jess and I, my girlfriend and I will, will, you know, decide on a TV show or a movie or something. And, and if right. we can't decide, it's basically up to her. <laughs> she picks what she wants. <laughs> it just so happened the stars aligned that night and she went out with a friend for a drink. And I was like, great. So I ordered a pizza and got a glass of bourbon. And I'm like, I'm going to watch Blade Runner first. I'm oh, going to get into the absolutely. movies that the feeling. And then I'm going to turn on the live stream. Well, and then I, can only... I, got about, I got about halfway through the live stream before she got home, but I did catch okay. most of it. And then the next day I finished watching it. Awesome. Man. So I can yeah. I'll, I'll pause real quick. I could only wish that you had seen my wife. She went as Pris from the original Blade Runner and she yeah. looked spot on the black paint and the blonde. Wow. Oh, it was awesome. But you know, unless I could have got her on stage, I guess we didn't get her in, in the, in the, in the video, but that's a great combo, man. Blade Runner. Yeah. So, so then on screen, Sunday, that's awesome. They went to uh, her grandparents. It took the kids and stuff. And I was at home watching the Bears game. And after the Bears game was done, I'm like, I'm going to put on They Live. And I'm yeah, like, now we're talking about the new marathon here. So I like so, it. Uh, yeah, I got in the spirit for you guys. Um, but, oh, I love it. I love it. But anyway, I, I did check out the live stream. Um, and I want to talk about like the costume and the music video and all that kind of stuff. But I caught the two new songs that I hadn't heard before that you had mentioned you were going to put on whatever's next mm -hmm. um the first one was a banger that thing was was a ripper man it was like a little bit more up faster paced i guess than, than this album it's, it's by far the fastest song that we have for sure i right like now. that man it was it was awesome i like that a lot I, I mean to be honest like high I energy I, I typically lean that direction more more like deserty or at least the faster stuff the super slow sludgy stuff has not always been my thing, right? Um, but I but I will say that you do have some slower stuff on this album that I I thought was awesome. So thank you, um, thank you. The second one was not as fast, but I did catch the solo. I don't sorry, I don't know your guitarist's name, but the, uh, the solo that he ripped through <laughs> was awesome too. I made note of that. Uh, I had to watch that a second time. I, I mean, he he's phenomenal. Uh, a phenomenal guitar player. Uh, he was definitely feeling it that night. And I was really glad that we got that to tape because he crushed it. And I, and I've heard it, you know, in the jam room, he, he'll, he'll rip stuff like that all the time. Um, but when you're in the moment, you know, you're kind of just, you you, I lose myself on stage half the time. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing or what's going on. I'm just, I'm into it. Uh, but as a, as a viewer, you know, I have to watch him play that solo and I, even I was like, holy crap, that was badass. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it was pretty cool. We were very happy with that, with both of those tracks. The first one being very, very up tempo. The second one is very kind of melodic and then it gets super heavy. Uh, and we kind of have this idea moving forward that we've got a couple ideas that we want to, we're rolling with right now is that we, we're looking back into like our legends of who we like look up to as musicians. And, and most of those bands didn't record to a click and we're going to get, we're getting off the click, which half our album already was, was not on a click. We just said, you know, we, we want it to move and swing. Uh, and our drummers, that's where his talent really shines through is making things move and swing and feel. And um, we also want to record it live. Like we want to record, you know, in the room at the same time together, like like Zeppelin and all the great bands of that era, which blows my mind. If, if anybody know, if, if anybody stops to think about how they record their albums in comparison to how it is now, it truly shows you the talent that they had. And so we're striving to do something something similar like that as well. And so, um, but those songs are just kind of a taste of, like I said, of where we're going, where we, we definitely, have, first album is really an introduction to who we are because we didn't even know. We had only been six practices and we went to the studio. And, you know, Rusty Do Riff, hey, it was kind of a stoner riff. Uh, this riff's kind of like a deserty riff. This is a doom riff. We just liked them because they all, we, we liked the songs, we were recording them. But now I think we we're understanding ourselves better 
in the room, like knowing each other's strengths and how we're writing for each other. Uh, and that's where I think the, the music's evolving, which is, which is really exciting for us. Yeah, that, that kind of answers my question. I was going to ask just kind of, you know, a lot of people sit on this first album for as long as the band has been together. You, you kind of write it as you're going and you have all the time in the world to write that first album. So it came mm -hmm. out and you had it for a while. You have more songs ready. You worked with Blasco. You had a great engineer. What did you learn from making this record, either musically or about yourselves, that you are now putting into this second album, even though some of those songs were written at the, the very same time? You know, how mm -hmm. are you approaching it differently from what you learned from either from Blasco or just from, you know, going through the motions this this first time? Yeah, because we were, I mean, we were really making it up as we went, you know, the first time through. And, and uh, I think we were all just eager to, I think we had all been in projects that you know had had fizzled out or hadn't worked and uh i hadn't been in a project in maybe 15 years you know and it was like and it was crushing me i was doing cover stuff just to you know perform and our drummer had just got out of a, uh, of, a, of a band that it just didn't work out and and rusty and i the guitar player were playing with other musicians and it just wasn't working out and so we were, we we're all getting kind of like really frustrated and then we got so excited when we got in a room with these other musicians that it just started to like really gel we got so excited we we're like Let's get this to let's get this to tape, and we carry no regrets with that. We're very happy with the record, but I think now we're really understanding. You know, we've learned kind of the the process, the business aspect. Learning from Bra Blasco has been invaluable, you know, and and just and just in any interaction we have, because uh, you know he he's very he, he understands the scene from a business standpoint as well as um, like what is going to like what is appealing you know, to, to an audience because he knows, and we know that none of us anticipate writing this next record and it's, we're going to quit our day jobs because it's going to just top the charts of everything, you know, and we, we, we know that we don't, we don't do it for that, you know, and uh, that's kind of the best part about it. We've always kind of stayed in that realm. We don't really do it for any other reason that we just love writing music and we love being with each other and creating in the room. And uh, I think, seeing how to be honest how stressful some of this album was because like i said we got it done and then all of the this the chaos that was the world right. uh, one of the coolest things about most of the reviews we get are people saying it's, it's hard to believe this band's been together for two years well i laugh at that because i'm like yeah we've only been together two years but that record was recorded we'd been together for like two or three months that that album was you know we've been together but we Think about it. Two years ago, the world shut down. You just about you know like a year and a half ago. So it's just been strange. But um, we've learned that we write music for ourselves, and the rest will take care of it. And and we know we're not going to rush because while we may have rushed to get that record out, and then all of a sudden the world shut down, and we just sat on it. Um, it became a blessing in disguise, right? There was no there, during that time. Blasco discovered us. We got signed to Ripple. We got work. We started working with Carl Dane and Leiden, right? Like all these different things. So yeah. we know that we just trust the process. And I think we've learned a lot about mainly who we are as, as a, a band um, more so than anything else. And that was just kind of with us and, and, and working with Blasco and, and people like Todd at Ripple, man, I can't praise him enough because he's all about family and love. And, and that's kind of what we're about. And we're all about like, embracing other bands and and lifting them up and then and, and, mm -hmm. you know which in turn we lift each other up and it's been been really positive man i really i really enjoyed it and that's why we can't wait to continue moving forward so you mentioned as we roam as a good indicator of the next album i heard the two songs what else can you tell us about that second album i mean should we expect heavier should we expect slower should we expect faster how would you describe this next one in in relation to this first one it's funny because the first album was very eclectic you know it has yeah it's got stuff yeah, really it's, got, it's got grunge it's got doom and so i'm like i'd like to say this next record is gonna really we're really we've really found ourselves and we're really gonna hone into this genre it's probably gonna be even more eclectic uh, but I think for the better, you know, I think we're pulling in more things that like Rusty, for, for example, is an absolute guitar beast, like we mentioned earlier. And I think his whole life, 
uh, I mean, he grew up as an eighties guy, man. And, and eighties was about shredding and about being on the one and, 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 and riding to that grid. And it's awesome that we bring Phil, our drummer into the band because Phil is so like, he's a studio drummer, mind you. So he, he works to a click all the time, which is probably maybe why in his original stuff, he's like, I don't want to do that. And he's pulling, he's, man, he's been pushing Rusty so much, like just pushing him, like just get out there and get out there and get weird. And man, the stuff that is coming out of him because of that has been phenomenal. And uh, I think that he's, he's really drawing more to his influences um, than he may have had, you know, like, like, like his original roots, as opposed to saying, hey, I want to be in a stoner rock band. So I'm going to write you know, something that might fit, like there's a couple songs, there's totally, we want to write a stoner rock song, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's like, I don't, we don't, we, we never cared about the genre then, but it just happens. But now we're like, we, we just, we could care less. And we're hitting, we're hitting just, I, I'll say that the, al we're just hitting a lot of, of different decades, I feel like, but we're hitting, the, the album's going to be uh, heavier, but not doomier, if that makes sense. It'll be, it's going to carry more weight. Like it's going to really, it's going to hit harder. I think, I think it's really going to hit harder than the previous because we are now allowing everybody to go to work. Whereas opposed, like, like Phil always describes this album as, man, this was like Ryan, this was the Ryan and Rusty album where it was like that great riffs and let, and let, you know, Ryan doing some vocal on top. Whereas this album will be a true high desert queen album where everyone's going to be showing their strengths, I think. So that's cool. that, that's why I'm really excited about it, and and we yeah. hope everybody else, you know we when we hope that uh, it's it's well re received. It's going to be a while because Ripple is going to obviously want us to play, you know, behind this record for a little while. But but I love about Ripple though is they're not going to say don't record. They're like they're, they're like move forward, move forward. Yeah. We're actually going to record. We're actually going to record acoustic album next. That's actually what we're going to do. I, was, I don't remember where I I heard you mention that, but I was going to ask you about it. I was going to ask if you're going to put any ballads on the second album first, uh, but mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> yeah probably probably no ballads no okay so tell me about the acoustic album that sounds like a an interesting idea especially now that you just released your first one you're already talking about the, the third one <laughs> so yeah ex exactly so it's really the i guess the album we're talking about previously is gonna be the third album um and once again we're very fortunate to work with ripple because they're they're wanting to they're willing to release this uh, acoustic record it was an idea we had it stemmed from uh, we had a show, you know, we're just trying to work our way out of the pandemic and, and the shows have to be seated. And, and, you know, we were lucky to have shows where other parts of the world were not down here in Texas. And, and, um, we actually, and we were actually going to do it. And we had this huge, which you probably read about this huge, like ice storm that came through, um, Texas this past winter. And it affected us, you know, and, and, and our, our drummer couldn't make this show. Uh, he was going to do it, but you know, we made the decision like, dude, take care. We, we got it. Well, I, I don't, we don't cancel shows. I'm, I'm big on that. I don't cancel a show. We'll, we'll find a way. And we did. And we decided to do an acoustic and it was kind of rad because uh, it, it could have gone 10, a uh, hundred different ways wrong. Cause we were between literally two heavy bands. Like there was a yeah. band called Rick Child Billy's Burger Patrol. It was yeah. awesome out here, by the way, they're awesome. And they're real up tempo and heavy and great. And this band called, and you haven't heard them, check them out. They're called Bridge Farmers. I think they're I one of the know. heaviest, they're one of the heaviest bands and super talented in, in Austin. Uh, really great. So two of the heaviest bands in, in, in Austin and and we decided to throw an acoustic album. And I, I put the show together, like I had booked it. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do the smart thing. I'm going to put us, we'll, we'll open the show. It makes sense to have an acoustic show open and blah, blah, blah. And then I, I guess as I got closer to it, I go, you know what? Screw it, man. Let's just. Let's just do it. Because I will say that as a fan, I thought about how it was a five band bill, which is a lot, of, you know, normally you know, two or three bands is a good bill, but I put five on it because it was like, uh, we're trying to work away out of this pandemic. You know, we're trying to like, hey, live music is back or it's, it's getting there. And we wanted to make a statement with this, with this, with this rad five band bill. And I go, I know when I go, if I go to a show that's got that many bands, my eardrums are probably shot. So we decided to be in the middle of it. It's like kind of let you breathe kind of let your eardrums breathe before yeah. uh, Bridge Farmers closed the show and just, you know, tore, tore them up, you know, just destroyed them after that. And it went awesome. We literally, we had to make a decision within three, like Phil couldn't do it. 
two days later, we're like, well, what do we do? We practiced the day of, like just figured them all out acoustically and then went and played. And it was, it was all awesome. songs from Secrets of the Black yeah. Moon? Okay. Yeah, we just did a, we just did acoustic versions of Secrets of the Black Moon. And it was awesome. Like we had so much fun and it got well, it got well received. And we also were, were very uh, cognizant of a quote from, um, of course, it's going to slip my mind. One of the greatest producers, Rick Rubin, one of the greatest producers in the world, who always says he will not he will not let a band or an artist. I don't know if the, I don't know if this applies to his hip hop stuff that he does, but when he has like a, a band come in, he will not allow a band to record a song like a metal song or rock song if it can't translate well to acoustic. And I've always thought that was really cool, you know, yeah. and and so because. And then there's some truth to that, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's musical, uh, it'll translate well. And we were surprised how well it translated. And, and, uh, you know, we recorded the show just, you know, like on an iPhone, nothing fancy. And I sent some clips to, uh, to Todd and, and he really dug it. And it just so happened at the same time, you know, uh, um, Wino was releasing an acoustic album that Ripple put out and, uh, they're, they're, it did really well. And there's this, you know, uh, there's a market for it, you know, and and we always respected all the bands like Alice in Chains and Stunt of Pilots and Nirvana and those bands always did those sure. my favorite albums, the unplugged albums, yeah, like my favorite great. albums, the stripped down versions, not just not just acoustic versions, like stripped down, you know, adaptations of those songs. And so we said, <clears> you know what, oh, we want to do that, uh, and so we're going to do that, and. As we've had that in, in our mind, it looks like we're going to do. We're going to end up having some acoustic versions of the record, but we're. It's looking like we may have more just straight acoustic originals on there too, mixed with with um, acoustic versions of the uh, Secrets of the Black Moon, which will be which Very will be cool. kind of cool. Yeah, I was going to ask if you're going to do any like originals because because that's always cool too. I mean, it, hearing versions of the songs that you already know like the nirvana one is probably the most well-known you know oh absolutely songs acoustically was cool but it was well i guess they're not originals for that night but doing the covers of yeah, the other band, right? non nirvana songs was the coolest yeah. part to me i think those and, are my favorite parts of non nirvana they were the best all. they were the best all the meat puppet songs right all yeah. they were like the best songs that they did on that record and so yeah. we we actually did you know we're still toying with the idea of of throwing some covers on there too you know if, if there's a it's weird because it's 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 a weird spot i've never been a fan of an original band like doing a cover on their album i'm just for whatever reason i've never been a fan of that um I'm, i have no problem with like hey there's this this compilation album you know where we're gonna get a bunch of bands play tribute totally that's 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 where those that's where those songs should go yeah. Uh, in my, you know, that's just one man's opinion. That means nothing or full, because or a full covers album. Correct. Right. That yeah. there, that to me, there's an outlet for it. And so I've never been a fan of doing a cover like on, on a record. And, um, and it was actually brought to my attention by like, you know, like our bass player or people are like, well, dude, look at Nirvana. Like they, they did that. And they're like, yeah, you're right. You know, so there, there is, if there's an outlet for it, it would be on a record like that. Cause you know, um, I've done acoustic, cover band stuff for a while just for just like i said so i could stay active before yeah. uh before we got into hydrogen queen so and we always play all the all our favorite ones but that's the thing I, I don't the greatest thing about the nirvana songs the meat puppet songs was those were not popular songs right they were great freaking songs but they became famous because nirvana did them you know um so we would like to if we were gonna do something we would want to do something in my opinion i would want to do something obscure because uh, I'm a weird, I like weird stuff. I like weird stuff anyway. Because um, we we live in Austin. If you want to hear someone do a an amazing Alice in Chains cover, you can literally go down the street, you know, and you'll hear it. Right. Or you want to hear someone co you know, cover the shit out of ZZ Top, you'll you, you'll hear it, you know. So uh, we're, we we want to think outside the box. Is kind of where we are. So I think that's a good but, idea. Yeah, I I love when bands do the obscure stuff. I mean, how many times do I have to hear Ace of Spades? Right. cover you know like do another song right. they, they've got like a hundred albums <laughs> i know i know so so that's kind of where I, we fall i think on as a band on covers um but I, it's funny because we were like yeah we'll do that to fill space you know to fill up a record but like i told you we started writing acoustic stuff and 
I don't know if there'll be any room for covers. So who knows? We'll, 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 we'll see what happens when we get in. Like we're going to be playing an acoustic show. We're about to announce it uh, here in another month. It's going to be just like a, like a pop-up show uh, where we're really just preparing for uh, going in the studio and uh, we'll, we'll see what we conjure up and, and what, what we take to the studio with us. Well, listen for the third appearance on the slightly fun podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Everyone bring your acoustic guitars and you guys can that would, an acoustic song right here. That would be cool. I'm not going to lie to you. That would be really, really cool. I, I would actually enjoy that a lot. And I know the guys would go. too. So, right so that, that might be, that'll be something we can set up. A right. premiere, Tell right? Me. An acoustic premiere. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I, I've, I've pitched yeah. the idea to a few people that were on here. Some some of the like lesser known people. And I'm like, maybe you guys can perform something. No one's taking me up on it yet. But I'm I'm, I'm feeling confident about this one. And I've seen a lot of the, uh, you know, you 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 uh, interview a lot of great bands. One thing I noticed though, like in the in the genre, I guess what genre we're considered in, you know, like this heavy rock, stoner, doom, whatever genre. So I try after we did that acoustic show, I was like, man, this is fun. Like we should. I tried to I tried to book a set up a show like an all unplugged show, and I was amazed. There's not many bands who are willing to do that. Really. And so like people were like, no, nah, we it won't translate. It won't translate. It won't. We can't do that, and I, I'm like, you'd be surprised, I think. And so I'm gonna Melton keep trying. Have released a, a huge, huge acoustic album. Yeah, and we Tons of were, we made it. We made a joke about that because they, they released it the same day we released our album, and I, I, you know, we were making a joke. We go, oh my gosh, did the Melvins not do their homework and know that we we're releasing a record? I mean, that's <laughs> like that's poison to their record. You know, that's, that's just so unfortunate for them. <laughs> but, but but no, we we know that's that they're legends. You know, and I. Yeah. I listened to all 36 tracks, you know, on the Did way you, to. I haven't, I haven't done the same yet, but. Oh, on the way to my our big show Friday and on the way home, I listened to all of them because it's so cool because yeah. they have stuff from all their whole catalog. It's great. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. But yeah, but you're like I'm saying, there's clearly bands are, it, it's capable. If the Melvins yeah. can do it, it's one of the sludgiest, grungiest bands of all time. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It can be done, but I'm just, I, I, I don't, I think people are afraid that there's no, like they're like, why? Why would I do that? Like we're a heavy band. That's what people identify as. As I go, you'd be surprised. Every metalhead I know loves a ballad. Loves, you know, every Alice in Chains fan will tell you that one of the best albums they ever did was was Unplugged. You know, so yeah. it's just there's something there's something there for sure. Yeah, and I, I think it still remains heavy too. If you if the lyrics are right, if the feel, if right. the vibe is right, it's still a heavy song. Yeah, absolutely. Just, not, you know, distorted and plugged in and loud or whatever, but. All right, tell me about the the costume party. Like I said, I watched the the live stream. How did that night go? Did you get some good costumes in there? And I think yeah, it was re recorded a music video too the same night. Yeah, it was it was great. So the idea, you know, the movies that do them costume parties, we all dressed up in costumes that because we we knew we wanted to film. We're filming a music video, and the concept is we we're, we're going to be in these costumes, um, and so we filmed our live footage, which will, you know, be our B roll, like our cutaways from the, from the actual music video uh, or the, the conceptual part of the music video. Uh -huh. um, and so we had this idea to do, you know, a party for other people, you know, to come as costume party. And, and uh, it was pretty rad. Uh, we had, uh, I knew it was going to be a cool night when the, literally the first person or first two people to walk in the door, uh, the guy was macho man. And he was like, he was like decked out, Randy Macho Man Savage decked yeah. out. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, his wife was, um, the name's going to escape me, but it's from the, the little girl in the Adams Family movies and the show. Like she was Wednesday? dressed like that. Yes, she was dressed like Wednesday. Thank you. And, uh, you know, and then it take, didn't take long. We had, uh, we had a Steven Seagal show up, uh, uh, which was, yeah, nice. which was awesome. A lot of people did the they live thing. Like a lot of people came oh, in really? with the glasses. The, yeah. the, the glasses, you know, like, and I even made a, I think I made a post at one point, like, Hey, if you don't have a movie that doom costume, you can literally just wear glasses and say you're yeah. from, they live. We had a lot of people decided to wear like stuff from like just an eighties era, which was cool. Eighties or nineties, which was cool. Uh, we had, um, we had natural born killers. Uh, both of them, uh, show up. We had a couple, uh, super cool. Um, it's funny because there's one guy who came in, and I'm still not sure if he was in costume or not, but he came in in like big old spikes and like boots. I was like, and he had like a crazy like mohawk. I was like, 
this is awesome. This guy just showed up in a road warrior costume. And I talked to him a little bit and I, I, I still don't know if he <laughs> was in costume or not. I like to think that he was. Uh, that was it was cool because he looked freaking amazing. Be great. Um, but, yeah. Hey, what are you dressed up as? And he's like, I don't, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I know. But I'm, I'm sitting there talking to him, you know, in a, in a, a Marion Cobrietti, you know, from Cobra, like costume, which, which by the way, like five people got, which was kind of my intention to begin with is I, I like, I like the obscure, you know, I've got, you know, I got no hair. And so I was like, man, I'm going to go. The, the easy thing was I was going to go as Bruce Willis. I was going to go as John McClane. Yeah. And I was like, it, it's easy. All I got to do is put some blood on my face. I can wear a white beater that's all dirty and beat up. I, I go, I go no shoes. Like I've been walking around barefoot, you know, and put blood, fake blood on my feet. And I'll be fine. Uh, but then I was like, everyone's going to recognize it. And, and to me, I just didn't want it. And so I was, I was Cobrietti that, you know, but to me, uh, I don't know if you could, if, if, if you agree with this, but I, I, to me, it's 10 times better to have the one per the, the one to five people that night that, that recognized me as Cobrietti. Yeah. As opposed to if there was a hundred people there that knew I would have been John McClain there, that I got more, I got more enjoyment out of those people than anything else. So it was cool. Cause most people were like, what's with the, what's with the get up? Like what's, what's going on? What, I noticed what are you, you doing? Stuck, you, you were in character all night too. That oh. was impressive. <laughs> uh, and that was hard because, uh, you know, Cobra is not the nicest guy in the world. And I, I, I like to think I'm a pretty nice guy. And so I had people like come up to me like, you know, Oh, we heard the album. It's great. And I'm, I'm trying to be like, yeah, <laughs> clean up your act. You know, I'm trying to like be rude. And I had, I take my glass off. And be like, all right, I'm going to get a character and tell you, thank you so much. Like, I really appreciate it. And I, I put him back on and put the matchstick back in my mouth and I, I go back to being Cobra Eddie. Yeah. But, uh, it, it was fun, man. It was a lot of fun. I mean, our, we had fun with the costumes. We had rusty was, uh, snake Pluskin, uh, from escape from New York and, or escape from LA. Um, we had Phil, our bit drummer was, uh, non from the Superman movies which is great because he's like the not the most known villain, even from those movies. But he's like, Phil's like 6'4", he's a big dude, and he has a big giant beard. And I was like, he couldn't be, he had to be non. We were joking that if he could just find a way to like, blow like everyone over, you know, like with a superpower that, that he had. Uh, and, and it's also a fun fact that non is not dead. He's still floating in space somewhere. That's what Superman did to him. So uh, it, it, it was cool that he came down for that. We had John Rambo on bass, uh, and then we had uh, Vincent Vega because he came with it as a tandem with his wife. Uh, nice. they, they, did, they did the Pulp Fiction. It was great. So the music video, and can we expect to see the music video from that? Oh, yeah. So that's one of the main reasons why we did that, right, is we, we filmed a live stream, which was fun. We filmed... We had several well, cameras. The live stream was great, by the way. You guys had like a hundred different camera angles on that live stream. Oh man, uh, the guy who this was a buddy of mine who did it uh, from Wizard Broadcasting. I said it wrong right. on the live stream. I felt bad. I called it Wizard Publishing. Wizard Broadcasting to, to, to fix that. Uh, maybe I can fix that in post. Um, uh, we it did really well. It was he did an am amazing job. We had so many camera angles, and even I was watching it afterwards. Like, wow, man, super cool. We had some audio issues, where, which is cool about it, though, is we, that's always the, ch the challenge you make with a live stream uh, because the room is so loud. So yeah. you don't, you're not going to turn the, you're not going to put much in the mains with guitars and bass and drums. So the vocals are super loud. Um, but we knew that was going to kind of, that was a risk. So we recorded everything and we also multi tracked everything. So we're going to mix down. We've taken them off YouTube uh, and then we're going to, Ripple's going to reshare it once we, we mix it down, so that'll be kind of cool. Because we oh, cool. like we, we don't anticipate playing a lot of live shows here very soon. We we, we do want to actually we have all this stuff written, so now we need to get a studio ready. That's kind of what that's our main goal right now. We we've got we're gonna tour. We can talk about that a little bit. We got tours planned in March and in and in and in June, and but we're gonna worry about that. You know, we're gonna work about recording the the album, but the music video. So we've only recorded the B roll. We actually haven't recorded the video yet. Uh, but we'll probably do that here in the next few weeks. And then, man, if there's any indication how our the same guy who did the mountain versus the quake video, he edited so fast. Uh, yeah. I think it could be quick, but it's funny is we haven't decided what song we're going to do. We, we knew we went into it, uh, with did she, we were like, we're going to do it for did she. Um, but man, as we roam is getting a lot of very positive feedback right now. And 
Yeah. We want, and if we, if we don't use this video for that song, we, we will do a music video for that song. It's, it's, you, it, it, I think the last one you said that you were going to do Heads Will Roll for some sort of well, music yeah. video. Well, the thing is, we have I have this super great concept for Heads Will Roll, but it's, it, and we're going to do it, but it's a production. It's, it's not going to be something we can do in like a day or two. It's, okay. it's going to be, it's, it's a really cool idea. Uh, only thing I'll give away, which will mean nothing to most people because they've probably never seen this film, but it's going to be uh, modeled after um, Samurai Cop, which is a terrible good movie. Who's that? I mean, if you've not, if you've not seen it, the concept of the film, I mean, it's so B, there, B movie, there's no famous people in it, but the okay. concept of the film is the main act, the main character is a cop, uh, a white guy, mind you, who is, but as opposed to being a cop with like guns and things, he likes to use a samurai sword uh, yes. and he fights, fights crime with the samurai sword. Oh, all you got to do is when we're done here, uh, and if just YouTube uh, samurai cop, it's awful. And that's why it's so great. So, and I actually got permission. I, I reached out to the actors and directors and producers like, please, please. And we got permission to use it. And so we're going to use it. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be cool. But that'll be for Heads Will Roll. So that, that's, Cool. It's it's we're not we're kind of working backwards. That song's already been released, but you know, videos. I, what I like about videos is a song can be out, but then a music video will release for that song, and it kind of makes you see that song and hear it in a different light. So that's sure. that, that'll that'll be cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's do the guest question now. All right. Cool. So before before we do the guest question, I'm going to explain it to everyone that's listening or watching. You can go to the Slightly Fuzz Patreon and you can basically buy a question for the podcast for about 10 bucks a question. So we have our first one come from Jeff. He's in a, a band called Brain Mater, I believe. Cool. Uh, let's see if I can it, share it. M-A-T-E-R? M-A-T-E-R, I believe, is, is how he spells right. it. There's there's a seven in there on his Instagram, but I, I don't I don't know that that's uh, actually how it's Pardon pronounced. It. All right, cool. What we got? Hello, my name is Jeff, also known as the Dury King, and I am asking a question for the Slightly Fuzzed podcast this week, and my question is going towards the lead singer of High Desert Queen, and so my question, Mr. Ryan, is when you sing, do you always stick to the same genre, or do you mix up your genres? If so, what genres do you like to sing other than stoner rock? And if you don't, why is your reason? You know, because some people, you know, they like to sing opera. They like to stick with opera or they'll sing heavy metal and stick to heavy metal. But then you got other people go all over the place. But, oh, yeah, this is my friend Fedge. He's also here with me. Anything you would like to say, Fedge? Taxation is theft. That is gnarly. Oh, man. All I can say first off is I love the production of just that whole – that's awesome. That is so movies that doom worthy. Yeah. yeah. Like, like I don't know if they intended – you know, when they, when they had a question for for me from Hiders or Queen, if they knew that what they just put together was going to completely appeal to me, but that was freaking awesome. I love that. Yeah. That, was, that, was, that was badass. Uh, but all right. So to their question, um, it's interesting because I, uh, yeah, I do listen to a lot of stoner rock, um, but my influences come from like, you know, I mean, and I, and I know stoner comes from grunge as well, but that would be what I listened to growing up uh, as a kid though. This may make some people laugh as a kid. The one thing that I would, when I wanted to, when I was, the first time I decided I wanted to be a singer was listening to James Brown. And I mean, I cannot hit a hit a high note like James Brown. And not few can, but I remember being little. We're talking like 
eight to 10 to 12 years old, my dad would put on a James Brown record and uh, I would wear it out. And I can still remember, this is like a kind of an embarrassingly funny story for me is that we had like a, we had a carpeted living room, but a linoleum kitchen. And I would take my shoes off and be in my, I would blast that cassette and I'd be in my socks and I would try to dance around like James Brown. I could do a little better if I'm sliding around in socks. And the, <laughs> the um, carpet was the make-believe audience. And I would sing James Brown, the top of my lugs, with, at an eight-year-old. I may have gotten that high, uh, but it was terrible. You know, it was so bad. Uh, but that was like my first influence. And uh, I don't know if that comes out in me. I, just, I do know that when I told that story to... Uh, just a, actually a close friend of mine who, who came and saw us play. He's like, when did you know you wanted to be a singer? Blah, blah. And he says that that comes out in my, in our live show because I go nuts and the energy level. And I guess maybe that yeah. I, I, I learned from James Brown that if you're going to sing in front of people, uh, you, you need to put on a show people. I don't care if they paid $5 or what, you know, to see you that you, they, they need to get their money's worth. Uh, but I, I also do cross genres a lot. I, uh, I listen to a lot of, um, hip like not hip hop but like uh, trip hop like i don't know if you know familiar with tricky or massive attack or portishead or so like that and i like some of their kind of off time vocals I'm, I'm listening a lot of that lady to, to kind of push me out of the box yeah. uh because i also it's it's easier to sing on the one you know when hey let, i hit it when the chorus hits i'll be loud when you get loud and uh I think a lot of these other genres like like that kind of show you uh, to let the dynamics of the song be heard bef before you come in. So you so when I'm coming in, it's adding to the song as opposed to just um, blending with the song. If that if that makes sure. sense. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think I think primarily though, like when I'm when I'm practicing my vocals, like I have I, got, I have a lot of vocal exercises and I, and I try to be. I sing like classic stuff. Like he mentioned an opera singer. I, I actually learned when I first took vocal classes, I was singing opera because it was the most horrible thing for me to sing. Cause it was, I'm not that, I'm not that good. Those, those people are phenomenal. So it was good. It was good practice, you know, like to, to try to be classically trained, but I try to cross genres as much as possible because um, while we're labeled, a, I think we get more labeled as a stoner rock band, anything else. Uh, we don't consider ourselves a stoner rock band. And so I think that if I was just to try to sing like all my stoner rock influences, like John Garcia or, you know, Josh Homme or, or um, who are phenomenal vocalists, but I, I just, I can't think of how many times I've heard a band go, man, I really like these guys because they sound like Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah. But then when it comes down to, am I going to put their record in or Queens of the Stone Age record? I, I put in the Queens of the Stone Age record. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just part of it. And I, I think that part of that, I don't, I don't want to get lumped into sounding like somebody else, you know? So, yeah. And you, you, as it, it makes me revisit a question you asked earlier about um, what we learned from this record and reading the reviews is actually helped us a lot because, oh, yeah? because we'll hear the, when the review says, Oh, this song really, ah, I can really hear some, some troubled. Ooh, I can really hear some some Caius in this one. I can really hear some some sword in this. And we're like, all right, well, screw that. We're gonna reinvent the whole freaking thing, and we don't want we yeah. don't want that. that. By the way, those are huge compliments. Yeah, but it pushes us to do more. And I know that we'll get compared to some of the same bands again. It doesn't matter, but it doesn't mean we can't we can't try. Yeah, yeah. but. But man, I can't. That was a really cool question, and I, I gotta thank that guy for, for for doing that. Now I'm gonna check out Brain, Brain Mater. Mater. Brain, Brain Mater, Mater I believe. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you I'll send your info. Awesome, man. I'm checking that out. That was awesome. That was super cool. Yeah. So, from a good question, I have a new segment for you called All right. Dumb Questions. It's just called <laughs> Dumb Dumb Questions. All right. Good. Okay. Dumb questions. Question. I like it. First question, is it high desert queen, high, <laughs> high desert queen, or is it high desert queen? 
since there is no true right answer to this question, this is why it's a perfectly dumb question. Uh, <laughs> if I had to choose between those three, it would be high desert queen. Okay. The middle, I would assume that's, that's what uh, yeah. and, and, and I'm not saying that because that is the most appealing of those three pictures, <laughs> but, uh, I, I think the high, the high desert is more indicative to, to who we are as a band, uh, okay. than, than, than the high part and definitely, uh, the queen part. Yeah. <laughs> That's All awesome. Right, question number two. Please promise uh, me you'll send you'll send me these slides so I can have I them. I will. Too. I will. <laughs> awesome. Uh, if you were to do a covers album, which we talked about, cool. would you consider doing Killer Queen? <laughs> and calling it High Desert Killer Queen. <laughs> oh man, uh, would we consider it? Uh, sure, we'd have to consider it. I mean, we were talking about like singing in different genres man to try to sing like like those guys and the harmonies and stuff yeah. that would be impressive so uh yeah. that is that is pretty awesome high desert killer that would be that would be pretty cool uh, i, I, I would to hear a, a stoner metal version of of any queen song it'd be pretty sweet yeah so i would i would say to your question yes we would consider it <laughs> right on all right question number three you often wear a nasa hat on stage and i believe you're wearing one right now That's ironically yeah is that because when you get on stage, you want to rock it? <laughs> oh, that's so bad. It's good. That, that question dooms. Uh, I've always, it's funny because the, the NASA thing, I don't know how it came to be a staple of ours. I've even had like people posting about, I had a buddy of ours in a band called Foster Mother. who's an incredible band. Yeah. Uh, he was at like the airport or something and he saw like a NASA booth and, he took a picture. Oh, I see they got the Ryan Garney section available, you know. So that's kind of become like a running joke. Yeah. Uh, the the NASA hat, uh, yeah. I I, I would I, I want to rock it on stage. So I, and I want to take off into space. So totally, I'm obsessed with space. That's why I wear I have a NASA hat. Uh, like people are always like, where's you know, wear something that you know is like wear a Gibson hat. Maybe we get a Gibson sponsorship. I'm like, dude, if I'm gonna get a sponsorship. I want freaking NASA to, to, to somehow uh, get involved in some way, but yeah, I'm also cool. just obsessed with space. So, so yeah, I totally want to rock it on stage. I like it, man. <laughs> All that's right. Me and, old, me, and old, me, and the, me and the Godfather right there, Todd Severn. That's a, yep. that's a good dude. Yeah. Good dude. Uh, question number four. Drugs are a common theme in stoner metal. Marijuana, mushrooms, and psychedelics. How would... <laughs> High Desert Queen feel uh, being the poster boy for crack. <laughs> this, oh, this, man. This so, says so we're like, the crack spoon, by the way, if you can't read yeah, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading that right now. That's why I, <laughs> that really that really tickled me there. So uh, we've got – so we, we would be – one thing I do like is that this shows uh, we're not messing around. We're going right to the hard stuff, right? We're not messing around with other stuff. Like High Desert Queen, this this shows that High Desert Queen does not mess around. Uh, yeah. But I don't I don't know if I'd be all in on the uh, secrets of the crack spoon. <laughs> That's awesome, <laughs> by the way. Uh, considering uh, none of us are, are crackheads, and me being a uh, high school English teacher may not be the best image for us to go with. <laughs> yeah, you know I you know, I'm sure you've seen at least a few of my parody album covers that I oh posted yeah to help. I love them, dude. Promote. I love them. They're awesome albums and singles and whatnot and i thought about posting either this one or the queen one and i was like i think crack is just too dark even for my channel i mean i've done like dicks and farts yeah. and just like completely well, fucked with people's artwork and i think crack is just dark even for me <laughs> to me well to me it's comedy and comedy is allowed to go to those uh those levels you know it's because it's never it's not meant to be taken seriously so if you do pose, you you have my blessing because I think that's hilarious. Secret to the crack spoon, because right. if you because if you can't laugh at yourself, you can't laugh at anybody else, man. You're not allowed to. That's yeah. the rule. All right, these are these are extra stupid. If, if, I, if you haven't seen that yet, um, oh, that's awesome. You are a big fan of movies that doom. I want to ask you about specific song titles from this new album and how okay. uh, what the influence on those songs were, basically. Okay. Uh, heads will roll. Was this uh, related to this scene from Day of the Dead? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, ironically, no, it was not uh, based on that scene. And unfortunately, no, but that I can, I can see the comparison. <laughs> Do you have a story behind Heads of Roll? Uh, yeah, uh, that is, it's, it's about going to the guillotine. So okay. like it is actually, you know, archaic in a way uh, about how um, it's funny that, you know, not to get political, but we're even more polarized now mm -hmm. than when I wrote this song probably lyrically about two years ago. Uh, to an, maybe I probably wrote the song lyrically two and a half years ago uh, in what I thought was the worst ever but it was at the time, the worst ever year for like, just, you can't, you're not allowed to say anything, you know, like you're just, you're going to be hung from the nearest tree. And, um, the, uh, that was the culture. And of course now it's called, it, it wasn't then now it's called cancel culture, of course. But, um, this, I laughed about how as the English teacher in me, I'm reading, like, uh, I was teaching to my class. This will be a lesson for anybody who hasn't read the crucible. But, you know, but about, you know, the Salem witch trials and how people would just like, if they screw up, all they do is they blame somebody else, call witch, whatever, and, and people forget they were at fault. And, and I laugh and I would talk about how in, in the, even days before that, uh, you, if you did anything wrong, there was no like trial. You just, head was chopped. You know, you were done. Yeah. Head was chopped off. And uh, so the song is a, is a kind of a, a mockery of, of what's happening now, uh, where like, it, it, I'm putting it in a position where like, if I do this wrong, they're, they're going to roll my head. In other words, like oh. my head's going to be chopped and it's going to roll off the guillotine. That's kind of what that's about. Nice. I you like can, it. you can determine what I'm singing about. That's what the chorus is about. You can determine what else I'm singing about. That's, that's up to art is not really meant to be explained. So let that part sure. be, be, uh, interpreted. Fair enough. As we roam, is this okay. related to Mad Max? Oh man, I wish I was that cool to write a song that was about Mad Max. I have, I, I wish I, I was, but no, it's not about uh, Mad Max. But not, not, not directly. But you know, I can easily tie it in because the song is about like going through uh, this universe and this world. Like we're all making it up as we go. We don't know what's going to happen. We're all just some of us. Some of us are living day to day and, and some, and I feel like that's actually sometimes the best way to be uh, yeah. the whole, like, if you, cause if you live in the past, you're not living. And if you worry about the future, you forget to make now better. So that's kind of what that song is about. And to be honest, Mad Max, was he living for tomorrow? No, he was living for that moment that day. So I wish I could say yes to your question, but no, I didn't write it based on Mad Max. One of the doomiest movies of all time. Yeah. Yeah. The rise in a, in a good way. Okay. The rise. Gotcha. Yeah. The rise. Is this about Terminator three rise of the machines? <laughs> that's awesome, man. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome connection. Uh, no, I, once again, I wish I could say yes to some of these because these are the coolest questions. Not say anybody, yes to anything, believe me. I know but these are the coolest <laughs> questions anyone's ever asked me ever. So <laughs> this is awesome, but no, it's, it's, it's not about the rise of the machines. Unfortunately, no, it's not that, that as a, perfect sequel to or it's a prequel to uh the song skyscraper which uh is about well something to, i'll let you interpret that but the I'll, rise I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what it's about right thing. now actually oh perfect 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 it's, it's about nakatomi plaza and die hard <laughs> now that that is true that that i did write <laughs> about nakatomi plaza because a big fan of die hard you know and uh christmas films you know it was definitely that but no i i wish i wish once again i wish i had written about that but I've actually, uh, fun fact, the first time I ever went to L.A., um, a buddy of mine was showing me around. And I, I thought it was interesting that he, the first thing he showed me was uh, the Nakatomi Plaza. Okay. I, just, I don't know if it's by chance, but he's like, by the way, and he's like, you know, like, oh, I can't wait to show you the sites. For example, this is Nakatomi Plaza. And I, I was like, do slow down. That's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> like I was, <laughs> I, was more, I was more intrigued to that because yeah. die, hard, die Hard Dooms, man, it's, it's terribly good. So that's cool. All right. This last one is a good one. Okay. The wheel. All right. I'm going to assume that the wheel is about this movie. Wheels of fire. <laughs> no, but I have seen that film. Have that's you a, really? It's, oh, heck yeah. It's terrible. I had, the, I had the trailer all lined up here and everything. Just in case you hadn't seen it, I was going to play the trailer oh, I, for everyone. Oh, it, I've seen that film. It looks pretty awesome. Oh, it's, it's, it's what's well, awful. Uh, but it's great. Cause I like watching these movies. Uh, like we have this kind of thing when we rehearse, 
um, I'll put a TV on in the background and we'll, I'll put like just shitty movies on. Um, but, but that are great movies, you know, like, uh, I, and I was, it's funny because I, we just started doing that. So maybe um, the third installment of me coming on your show, uh, I will be telling you how we wrote some of these songs while watching movies like Wheels of Fire or something and it, 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 that inspired. Uh, because I don't know if you've ever seen A Hard Ticket to Hawaii. No. But it's awful. Uh, have you ever seen the meme or a video of like a guy killing a giant snake with a rocket launcher? Uh, that's how bad the movie is. Um, that's the, the this movie Wheels of Fire. Uh, as a little trivia for you, is same same movie cut like back in the back then it was like uh, like a production company would make the film, uh, and they would just hire out and they'd have certain directors working for them. And this is from the same production company, and it's. Oh, it's bad. It's really bad. Like it's really, really bad. They they tried to like spin off the success of Mad Max, basically. Sure. Right. It, yeah. It's what it, I mean. I mean, look at the cover. It's a knockoff Road Warrior. For sure. I mean, it, in the awesome. trailer, and I'm sure a lot of movies in the '80s were similar in the trailers, but it's just got that perfect voiceover. Oh, about, yeah. like you know, just th that dark, like deep voice, and just like just chaos happening and. They're riding these cars and motorcycles and explosions. And I was like, oh, man, I, I've never heard of this one, but it looked. Really oh, it, dude, do yourself a favor. If you can find it. I don't know yeah. uh, how I, I I had it on VHS. Um, this is back. So fun, quick, quick, fun story here. I, I, I'm in a small town called uh, Kenyon Lake, which is, you know, kind of uh, just south of Austin. And we had a. You know, when all the, back in the days of the movie stores and the blockbusters and stuff, you know, we didn't have one. We had what was called Texas Video, and it was it was awful. Like it was, I mean, I didn't know as a kid it was like the greatest thing ever. I'd go in there, but you know, I still think about it now. Every movie, a new release movie was a dollar, and any non-new release was fifty cents. So this is back when I would like, you know, I'd find fifty cents in the couch and I would go rent Commando, and then I would yeah. rent Command, I would rent Commando again. And again, and again, because I could, because it was just fifty cents, you know. Uh, but we would find movies like that. Well, the, it went out of, when it went out of business, uh, we bought just a boatload of these like VHS movies, you know. And that I, I believe I, I don't know. I was I was really little because I was born in the eighties. But uh, I want to say my brother must have snagged the one, and that's that's how I saw it. Oh, it's it's bad, but it, <laughs> it but it, it's worth watching. It's worth watching. Yeah, I love it. Well, that's all the, the dumb questions I have. At oh, least in that segment, anyway. That was freaking awesome, man. That was, that was awesome. That, that was, <laughs> I, I was I was worth all of it coming back on. If you just did that part, it would have been worth it. It was awesome. Good. Was I'm glad you liked it. So I, I have a couple questions that I, I wanted to follow up from our last converse, conversation uh, on the first podcast. You mentioned something about a comedy pilot, and somehow I just kept going with the conversation and never, we never talked about it. Please tell me more about this comedy pilot. And for, for one no, thing, I'm... before you even tell me more about it, the idea of writing like a script seems so daunting to me. So how did you even know how to write a script? Because it, it... lots of people have an idea in their head, like I, someone should make this movie and it should be about this. And then they do this and this is how it ends. But actually writing like dialogue, like line by line, by scene by scene, like seems insane. So how did you know how to do that, and, and what was what was this experience like? Uh, it is daunting, um, and to a, to a fault where like, because it's easy to come up with ideas and harder to implement. Uh, because yeah. ideas are funny, and then you actually have to put people saying it. It's it's brutal, man. But uh, especially comedy, because it, it, that's all I really like to do is comedy. Um, and I I've got a lot of ideas that are all half written, you know, but. Um, it was a comedy pilot. It got, it got greenlit to be made. Uh, uh, it's before I tell you the name, I promise you it's not porn. Uh, it, so the concept is, uh, and it didn't make it, you know, we didn't get picked up. We got, it, it got, uh, picked up by a few like, uh, festivals, like uh, film festivals and things, but you know, no, no, no big I, surprisingly hbo didn't come knocking on my door i still don't understand but um the content was so i'm i'm, I'm a basketball coach 
uh, by, by trade. It's what I do. I'm a teacher and a coach. And so I always joke about seeing these uh, official like re- uh, referees. And I, they're usually you know pretty bad. At my level, they're, they're pretty bad. And so I came up with this idea. Uh, the main character of the show is uh, a, uh, a referee who um, – whose dream is to be uh, an NBA official. Like that's, that's the ex the upper echelon. Like you, that I'm imagining for a referee, that's, that's the highest point, you know? And, but he's, he's terrible. Like he's a terrible official. Uh, he's doing like 12 year old girls games and he's taking it like overly serious, right? Like he's crazy about it. And like calls every child, every travel call in a girls game, 10 year olds that, you know, every time they touch the ball, they travel, you know? Mm. And he takes it so seriously because he's he's always feeling like there's somebody out there watching, you know. I, I'm I'm gonna get picked up like a, like the, the record scout. executive, yeah, the referee <laughs> scout, right? Which which is ridiculous to even think about. Which yeah. I don't think that exists, but you know, <laughs> in this world I created, did so. The concept is that, and so the 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 ultimate job for him is the NBA basketball. You know, you think of basketball. There's like basketball rims and hoops and all that. And so the show was titled The Rim Job. Wow. <laughs> Just went <Yeah>. for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because if we were like, man, we're going to go hard or go home. And I think my only knock on, because uh, we're, I still have plans to, uh, to re pitch it, you know, to, we, we filmed it. It never, it's not anywhere, you know, it's not anywhere to be seen. Um, we have it and we, 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 we would like to publish it. Our, we could, I can put it on the YouTube channel right now. But we have ideas of of redoing it better this time uh, because we we had a name like the rim job, which I think, as you said, like you, that's the classic thing. What you just said, you went for it. We did, but then I feel like the show we kind of got worried about going too far, uh-huh. and and we didn't like, which blows my mind because we watch TV now. There's no rules anymore. So I. I you're called the rim job. We should have understood we weren't going to get picked up by any show to be like a, a network. You know, we knew that. Yeah, you're not going to be on NBC with a, a name like that, but you might go exactly. on, you know, exactly. Comedy Central or something. You yeah, know. I just wanted, I just wanted somebody. Ideally, I wanted to write it as a short. I wanted to write a bunch of like five, four to five minute shorts. Uh, but we did basically we combined several shorts that I wrote into one episode. Um, and I've written like eight episodes up to this point, you know, but I want to go back and actually, we actually dumbed down a lot of the comedy that I did because we were worried about it going too far. Uh, yeah. Well, next time we're, we're not worried about it, but yeah, it's, it's, but I will say it's writing comedy is, is, is super fun. It's right up there with writing music for me. Uh, I'm just I'm writing. writing oh, it's much. I, I, I will say writing comedy is harder than writing music uh, yeah. because writing music you if you sound like somebody else you know you're not gonna get wrote off like you people will still come listen to you but if you do a comedy that you rip off someone else's joke you plagiarized you know i can play a g to a c which every band in the world does and i'm not plagiarizing but you rip off a joke man I didn't realize also, how hard every it is single like, word matters in a comedy whereas like yeah. in a horror movie nah in a rom-com, not really. In a yeah. drama, not so much. Even in music, you, you can you can make lyrics nonsense yeah. or meaningful or yeah. anything in between, and you can have some throwaway lines, and you can not worry about it. But yeah, in comedy, the radio, every single listen. line has to be funny. It has to it has to hit every single person with that that funny. Yeah, you, you can make nonsense lyrics all you want. I mean, just listen to Radiohead. I don't even know what the hell he's singing, but that's his genius, right? Everyone says, "Oh, he's a genius." He's singing <laughs> yeah. about. Sucking on a lemon, and I know what that means. You know, it's he's really in debt. Like, who, what, who knows? And then the genius of Tom York is he doesn't say what the songs are about, right? He's like, oh yeah, whatever you want it to be. But comedy, oh, man, yeah. like you're gonna you're gonna get dissected. It has to land. Timing. It's about timing and pacing. And uh, the biggest thing about comedies I've learned is uh, casting, um, because you have to cast someone who can deliver your lines in a in a, in a way that that makes it funny. And you know, yeah. and if we're not, you know, we didn't have any money. You know, we got we were given a little bit of money to to make a pilot, and our lead guy was amazing. He's he's local. I, I watched. He does like a lot of improv stuff, like like literal like improv skits, kind of like who's lining his anyway kind of stuff. Well, they'll sure. they'll give us two words, and then they'll just go with it, and they're freaking amazing. 
but um, but then developing a whole cast that can deliver jokes over is is is, is very difficult. So yeah, we'll see. And I didn't act in it. I don't have the chops for no, it. No, I was going to ask. I, I wasn't sure if maybe you'd be in there or not. You were in the music video. You played a role in the, in the yeah. music video. Yeah, out of because the everyone in the band told me I had to. Like literally, what happened? I was like, "Oh man, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get this one guy, this guy." Like, no, 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 you be, you be, you be mountain. And I was like, "No, oh, I don't." But it's so funny about that. This is one of my, because this happened after we talked. Because I don't think I think we had I gone to Psycho Las Vegas after, after before we talked. I'm not sure. No, but it was right cool, after. It was it was when we were supposed to be releasing the the episode. Okay, yeah. So what was cool is this is just a cool story I want to share with the world because this is the one moment where I feel. I felt really cool. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, one of my favorite bands of all time is Sasquatch. One of my, just literally, I love that band. Like yeah. I love Sasquatch. And every, I always go to see him when I can. Well, we got to hang out with him there. You know, we saw him and, and I was talking to him. And it was the first of all, it was the coolest thing to just talk to him. But uh, uh bass player looked at me and goes, you're the mountain, right? And I was so like floored that A, He'd even seen the music video, yeah, and and was able to like actually call me the mountain. And he was asking for a story. He's like, "So is that like a nickname of yours you grew up with?" I'm like, "No, nah, dude, I'm I've never been called the mountain before. You know, like I just it's just a character in a video. You know." And he's like, "Well, you know what? I'm gonna call you mountain." Hell and yeah. so they so they were calling me mountain like all night. And then uh, when they played that night, they were like, "This song goes out." Uh, to the mountain, you know, because nobody knows who that is. Not, I thought I was a big thrill, you know, for me, but you know, it was just one of those one of those things where, like, oh, is that going to catch on? He's like, I'm going to make sure it does. I'm going to make sure it catches yeah. on. That's a great yeah, but It, it is. If I, I just wish I was like, you know, six five and worthy of that that name, because he's even telling me this, and he's like three inches taller than me. I'm like, no, man, I'm I'm not the mountain. <laughs> like, you should be. Yeah, but no, but no, I do want to write some more comedy. That's 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 in the. I'm riding the music wave as long as I can, right? And then we'll, sure. yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad I asked. That's, it's interesting that you that yeah. even got that far is, is an accomplishment. Even writing the yeah. script is, is huge. So I never got, cool. to, never got to tell that story. So I'm telling you, man, you're killing it. This is awesome. I, I, I forget about these things myself uh, that, yeah. that that's even happened. So that's cool. The, the last question I wanted to ask you, it, you mentioned in the last one that you were going to Chicago to see King Buffalo. Mm -hmm. you can't be going to to chicago just for king buffalo right you must be going for some other reason because i'm sure they're playing I, around you closer uh well I, we changed our plans because we, we were going for king buffalo and resin yeah like we that, that was why we were going i like both those oh. that's literally that's literally why we were going they, they weren't uh, playing anywhere cl closer to than 17 hours away uh, they they are um we didn't know when we bought the tickets first of all oh. Um, but I did, we didn't care. So, uh, we've been flying, like my wife and I, we, we've been trying to travel. We got a buddy pass. So like we, we basically one basically buy one, get one free. So we've been flying all over, you know, where we can just try to see as much as we can. Um, this is no, this is not a knock on King Buffalo or resin. Uh, we dropped that show. Uh, we got our money back on those tickets because we decided to go to, uh, even though we just went to Joshua tree, we're going to go to Joshua tree the same weekend, November 20th to see uh, Fatso Jetson, um, Big Scenic Nowhere's first show, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm a huge fan, and uh, Stoner. We decided to do, to go, to do that because of the venue. Uh, is uh, we, we know where it's at. It's, it's beautiful. It's super small. I'm in love with the area. It's like everything about it. And I was a little worried about going to uh, Chicago no in November because I'm was i from Texas. Man, that's going to be cold. It's so. Yeah. Uh, so we decided to do that. We're going to go back to Chicago, but, but yeah, we, uh, we, no disrespect to them. They are coming to Austin. So we're going to yeah. see them here. Not, not with resin, but you know, we haven't announced this yet, but I've booked, I've booked resin that we're going to play a show with down here in, in the spring, which would be cool, nice. but, right. um, which would be, which would be fun. But I really, the fact that it's big scenic nowhere's first show, and then you'll respect this the next day on Sunday. Um, uh, what's his name? Brad Davis from Fu Manchu uh, mm -hmm. is holding a um, fuzz pedal building uh, seminar uh, at this little tiny place in Joshua Tree, and I'm planning on going to that too. That'll be cool. Awesome, that's cool. T t totally nerding out on it. It'll be it'll, yeah. be, it'll be cool. 
So the the real reason I ask is because I was I was curious if your wife is into this type of music as much as you are, or is she just into your music and she like puts up with the rest? J Jess and I were having this conversation because she was like, you know, I wish you had like a podcast about like indie music. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, well, maybe you should just get more into like stoner metal. And she's like, absolutely yeah. not. Like she'll put up with the occasional like Queens of the Stone Age or something right, like right. that. But, but I, I knew palatable. that you had taken your wife to uh, Psycho, and and then you said you were going to Chicago for this this concert and stuff. But just curious if if she was into it as much as you, or if she just kind of supports you. <laughs> oh well, she's way into it. Like I, oh, yeah. she likes heavier music than I do. Um, like I mean, I always I used to joke uh, when I was younger about the Gateway Band for girls for heavy music is the Deftones, right? Um, I was just because Gina, say that, that Jess will put up with Queens and maybe the Deftones. Because <laughs> they're they're the gateway to heavy music. And and I know that when one of the first dates my wife and I went on, she mentioned that she loved the Deftones. And I was like, oh, it's so cool. But then, then the back of it, I'm going, yeah, but most girls do too. And they don't like all those stuff. But as we started, I mean, she had she didn't know, you know, a lot of the bands that I knew. She didn't know a lot of the heavier. She, she knew all like the the heavy bands were on the radio, you know, like okay. Deftones. And of course she's, a, and she's always been a fan of tool and, you know, and like bands like that. And, uh, I took her to a sleep concert, maybe, maybe the first month or so we've been dating. And I saw her like, she goes, she went nuts. She loved it. And really? I was like, Oh, uh, I was like, okay, that's when the heart beat a little bit faster. I'm like, I'm, I'm on, I, I may have found her here because when we first started dating, I wasn't really, you know, we've been dating for over three, uh, three years now. In fact, we just, just passed three years. So Hydrogen Queen wasn't even a thing. And, um, but I used to always joke that when we, when I started playing music, uh, on Hydrogen Queen, she'd always say, I really like it. Like, ah, you just, you just love me. So, and she hates that because she'll always say, oh, that sounds really good. I go, mm, no, nah, I, 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 I love you, but I, I can't listen to your opinion because you're, you're too biased, but she does yeah. really enjoy the heavy music. So like, She's all about the fact that we were traveling to go see Resin and King Buffalo. That was actually her idea. She found the show and messaged me like, oh, my God. She found the big scenic nowhere uh, stoner show before. I mean, I, I would have eventually, but she found it and sent it to me. I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah babe, let's do it. So nice. I'm very I'm very lucky. That's yeah. That's why the pandemic was so hard because almost our entire dating world early on was going to concerts. It's all we did. And we yeah. couldn't. So really thankful. I don't know what it's like in your neck of the woods yet. Uh, you know, concerts are 100 percent back in force here in Texas. And so I don't know what it's like where you're at. And it's not the same for everywhere else. But yeah, I'm, I'm very I don't fortunate. know. I mean, they are having some shows up in Chicago now. We're, we're a couple hours away from Chicago, but um, I don't know. I'm not really sure if it's, it's, quite, it's I'm sure it's not quite what Texas is. But you know. yeah, it's it, it's I mean, the doors are fully open. It's cool. Like we just played, you know, a show. Our, for our album release and it, we had yeah. an awesome crowd you know it was great you know and yeah. it's, it's 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 really cool because even i've had shows and they've gotten better and better be, like just shows i've gone to not necessarily, necessarily played um because there's still a hesitancy you know there's still people not sure there's there's, there's part of the people that aren't you know they're still scared uh, there's part of the people that are just don't know how to interact with people again it's been so long since so they've socialized um you know so there's still some hesitancy but i'm seeing more and more people like down here, like coming out, it's, it's, it's been awesome to see, man, for, good, for bands. Yeah. And I'm, I'm meeting, I'm meeting people, I'm meeting bands that are, are moving to Texas, just musicians, uh, because just because it's a, Texas right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, for a lot of reasons. Right. And it's, yeah. and, and one of it is the fact that we're open. And yeah. so forget all the other jobs and, and things we have available here because we're open and because we don't have like different mandates and, and, and regulations and things, but, but man, uh, the music world in general is, is alive and well here. So, and the comedy scene, yeah. that's, that's the biggest thing I'm noticing in, in Austin oh, is, yeah. is the comedy scene is blowing up here. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. I, yeah. And I knew it would, as soon as Rogan said he was moving down there and another yeah. 50 followed, followed him. And Oh yeah, exactly. Now, exactly. Now you got Elon, Elon going down there too, I think. Right. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. If I couldn't, like, I could barely afford my apartment when I did live down there. I don't think I'd be able to afford it ever again. Man, <laughs> you and me both brother. I, I, well, that's the thing. So it's the Catch-22. I'm meeting a lot of musicians who uh, lived in Austin, and they, they've been priced out. Yeah. Uh, so 
so there's a lot of talk that, that Austin's not necessarily the music capital of the world anymore because musicians can't afford to live there. You know, so I don't live in Austin. You know, in fact, none of the band is lives in Austin, but we're considered yeah. Austin, Texas, because you know man. it's yeah. it's it's central for us. So, yeah. All right. Well, we we actually went pretty long on this one, so uh, I'll wrap. Yeah, because I was having a blast, man. I was having a Hell blast. Yeah, I'm man. Blast. I, I I think I had even more fun on this one now that I'm getting to know you oh. more, and, and we had more to talk about with with High Desert Queen, and I hope you come back a third time and you, yeah, you guys play us a song. And <laughs> I was going to demand that you have us back have me back a third oh, yeah. time but i i will do the best i can to make sure that that we're all on board because you know it's kind of cool and maybe something we can play with i don't know about connections or whatnot but even during the pandemic uh when we couldn't get together uh mainly because our guitar player lives in houston and that's three hours away from us um we would do stuff uh virtually you know like and yeah. there's actually no lag it was pretty impressive so oh, cool. at the very least we can try that but Sure. If we can schedule a time, which I know we can do, we can schedule when we're having a rehearsal out here. We can we can make it happen, man. Right on. Let's figure it out. All right. Well, cool, is man. there anything else you want to want to plug? I mean, everyone knows that your album's out now, so that goes yeah. without saying. But anything else? Uh, albums out. We got like we're not going to play a whole lot of shows, but the shows we are going to play are coming up are going to be very cool. Uh, we, we're we're we've got something in the works. We're going to uh, go play out of state, and then in March, I'm planning a tour to go west coast. Uh, which I know sucks because where you're at, we were actually planning on going uh, Midwest, but uh, Ripple so, has at some it, point. Ripple Ripple is pushing us first to go to go west. Uh, we've just we just announced our first um, show overseas. We're playing a music festival oh, called yeah. Red Crest Festival in I Scotland. I did want to talk about that, but uh, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll get the recap from you next time, I suppose. But yeah, that's but awesome, we're, man. You guys are going over there, and you have a, a handful of dates, right? That's that's we awesome. do. I've got. I've got about six shows booked so far and we're trying to get up anywhere from another four or five more at least. And we're music's being received very well overseas and we want to get over there and, you know, play in front of cool, cool crowds. And we've got a lot, we're having, we're getting so much help from some, some good bands over there that are, uh, I gotta, I gotta give a respect to Cyclona. You ever listen to Cyclona? Hell yeah. They're, yeah. I love that album love that they put out. We, I, I hung out with the guys in, uh, in Vegas and, Phil, the the singer, has been nothing but amazing in helping us. He's instrumental, and in, we're playing. I I got us booked on the you know they, they reached out to us to play the Red Crest Festival, and Cyclona happened to be on it as well. So we start we got to talking, and he's helped us put so many shows together. We'll we'll announce before too long, so it'll be cool. Cool. All right. Well, congrats again on everything, and and thanks, Ryan. Awesome new album, and um, you know. I'm looking but, forward man. to whatever's next and, and I hope we talk again soon. So much appreciate, man. We'll definitely talk soon. And uh, in fact, I'm sure we'll talk off of this too. Cause we, I, I got to get some of those, those are those freaking fly, those questions you asked me were awesome. So I need, I need those flyers, man. Cool. All right. Talk to you later, man. All right. Thanks brother. Much love. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.